So my name is June Williamson, and I'm a professor of architecture and urban design at the City College of New York. And I'm thrilled to be here to talk about what is to be done with vacant big boxes, dead malls, dying commercial strips, out of date edge scenes, and aging office parts and, art and garden apartment complexes. Uh, so I'll be talking about the CMU core concepts of sprawl retrofit. Uh, here's an outline of topics. And for more information, I invite you to consult the many books that have been written and published by CNU authors, uh, including Retrofitting Suburbia, Urban Design Solutions for Redesigning Suburbs by myself with Ellen Dunham Jones, uh, a former board chair of the CNU. Uh, and then uh, my second book, Designing Suburban Futures, a model from Build a Better Verb, which um, documents a, a speculative urban design competition for the suburbs of Long Island um, that took place in 2010. Uh, Galina Tatsheva's Sprawl Repair Manual, uh, Emily Talon's edited volume Retrofitting Sprawl, which just came out last year, and to which Ellen, myself, and Galina have all contributed, along with, along with many others. Uh, and then the foundational CNU report, uh, Great Fields into Gold Fields, a compendium of shopping mall retrofit uh, case studies that came out way back in 2002. Uh, so quickly though, a poll the audience. Who here grew up in suburbia? Okay, and who still lives in suburbia? You, you. And how many of you do work or your projects to involve suburban, suburban sites and locations? Okay, so just a little, little poll there. Uh, so, the prologue for my talk um, is looking at 20th century suburbanization and uh, obsolescence. Uh, so the North American urban landscape is dominated by the products of late 20th century suburbanization, resulting in an unsustainable built environment, I'm sure you, perhaps you've already heard this today, you know it, uh, littered with dead and sick malls, failing strip centers, houses with underwater mortgages still, uh, vacant big boxes and acre upon acre of asphalt parking lots. What to do? It's my contention that we must all, and I invite you uh, to join the, the, the project, um, to marshal the power of good design to help shape a more resilient future for our metropolitan surrounds, uh, the suburbs. So let's talk a little bit about suburbs within their urbanized context. 50% uh, of the world population is now urbanized, we're told, by, uh, by the UN. But what does this mean? What form does this urbanization take? Uh, we can look, let's see here, at, at, I know this, the resolution is a bit hard, but this blob here represents New York City uh, within the United States. And there it says um, 21.8 million people. But the city of New York, which we often think, this is often translated into 50% of the world's population now lives in cities. Well, that 21.8 uh, uh, million people, only uh, 8.3 million of that are the residents of New York City. So the remainder, more than 13 million, are living in the greater New York metropolitan area that makes the mega city of, of New York. So it's mostly uh, suburban. So in a way, a, a truer phrasing of the statement is that more than 50% of the world's population is no longer rural. Um, so, again, when people talk about the new world of cities, in your mind, you should put cities, perhaps in, in quotation marks, and remember that there's a whole range of types of urbanizations um, yeah, within that. Um, now, the graph then suggests that the United States is 81% urbanized. So, if we want to zoom in to the U.S., some more data. Uh, by 2010, we could claim that the U.S. was as much as 94 percent uh, urbanized, and that most of this urbanization is suburban in location and also in form. And we can argue that a certain percentage of the center city residents are living in areas characterized by, by suburban form, low density, use separated, car dependent. Uh, so there's a lot in this, this graph that I just want to unpack a bit. Um, so the U.S. became predominantly urbanized rather than rural um, sometime in the 1940s. That's what that line 
uh, represents. And at that time, with about 33% of the overall population living in center cities and about 17% in suburbs, so that was a two to one ratio of the center cities to their, their suburbs. Uh, by the turn of the millennium, uh, more than 50% of the overall population was now uh, residing in, in suburbs. <clears throat> And then in 2010, the census added the micropolitan um, uh, category to capture areas that were urbanizing, um, generally in a suburban form, but not in the periphery of a city center. Mm -hmm. So it's capturing other kinds of, of uh, non-city center urbanization. Now, and, and actually the fastest growing micropolitan area is the villages in Florida. Is anyone familiar with this? very large retirement uh, community. My mother lives there. Um, so it's over 115,000 residents. It's come up just in the past few decades. Uh, it's an uh, age-restricted community, uh, so therefore it doesn't need to be attached to a, a, a center city job um, center. Uh, so it does have three walkable town centers, which are very nice. And it's an interesting example, I think, of a place where a large majority of the residents have an electric vehicle uh, for daily local transportation um, and a dedicated infrastructure to support it. Uh, these golf carts, um, grade separated infrastructure paths throughout it, and charging stations in every dwelling. So it's kind of interesting, but very odd, uh, not at all diverse um, uh, example. Okay, so. Back to the graph. Uh, what we have here then that the share of the overall U.S. population, of course, it's grown in overall numbers, but the percentage share has remained relatively steady at about one third of the population for 70 years. Uh, is that percentage going to change considerably? Probably not. Um, and again, as the overall population grows, more people can move to cities without budging that percentage of the overall population. Um, so, what has to change? Well, these suburban landscapes, I contend, um, need to change. They need to change in physical character. They must change to become more sustainable and, and resilient. So, the big challenge, then, is to uh, improve the resiliency of the suburban landscapes where the vast majority of the U.S. population currently lives, representing all incomes, all ages, racist country of origin. Um, and the basic proposition is that we've urbanized more than enough land already, and we now need to steward it more sustainably and resiliently. Um, in other words, it's time to retrofit sprawl, uh, especially the obsolete uh, commercial stuff. Uh, and here I define resiliency as the need for urban systems to be reconceived and designed to have improved capacity to withstand disturbances climate change, natural disasters, energy and security without breaking down. How did we get here? Uh, I'm going to run through a condensed history of North American sprawl, uh, viewed through a series of paradigms that exerted a strong influence in the sprawling landscapes that dominate today. First up is the pastoral paradigm. That is the idea that in the face of industrialization of cities, a more moral life could be created outside the city where nature could be tamed and domesticated. This is a very strong concept that still persists. Um, chief proponents of this idea were Andrew Jackson Downing and Catherine Beecher, uh, who published best-selling housing guides in this period. Uh, this Hudson River School painting exemplifies the ambivalence uh, towards what cultural historian Leo Marx called the machine in the garden. You can see it chugging, chugging it through um, a clear-cut landscape. Um, on the left is Downing's scheme here uh, for what he called improving um, a working farmland into a picturesque country estate. And here is Riverside, the iconic planned early uh, railroad suburb designed by Frederick Law Olmsted uh, with its distinctive teardrop shaped blocks and designed without fences or walls to create the illusion of living in a large leafy park. Olmsted was quite bullish on um, suburbs. Uh, and in recent years, the bourgeois utopia of the elite suburban enclave was alive and well, as evidenced by mansions and grotesquely scaled up gated subdivisions, like this one near Orlando, 
uh, where Tiger Woods famously wreaked havoc a few years ago. You won't forget that. And the term bourgeois utopia is CNU, the coinage of CNU's own Bob Fishman. Next, the streetcar paradigm. Uh, which concerns the transportation revolution that occurred as amazing new technologies extended the reach of the walking city and dramatically altered patterns of urban development. Uh, Columbia University historian Kenneth Jackson uh, in Grabras Frontier, uh, he called it the time of the trolley. Uh, you can see here the extent of the privately built trolley system in Brooklyn, uh, and there were similar systems in place in all cities and in many suburbs, uh, though most were completely dismantled by the early 1960s. People of all classes were happy to leave the chaos and crowding of downtown neighborhoods. Streetcars opened up vast areas for development, mostly in a, the gridded and connected uh, pattern, uh, though not at all picturesque, um, of closely spaced houses. Uh, in contemporary developments, as on the right, connectivity is often sorely lacking, um, as in these back-to-back calls to set. The culprit? We could blame the automobile. Henry Ford's innovations in production and pricing made this new technology widely available, and the love affair continues unabated to this day, over 100 years later. Uh, many people, perhaps many of you, uh, place faith in new technologies to help us escape the current environmental predicament of global warming and climate change, brought about in no small part by the fossil fuel appetites of the automobile. Uh, and of course, autonomous vehicles are all the discussion uh, today, and I know here in, in Michigan it's, it's a news-making uh, topic. Uh, so what were architects and planners dreaming up during this period of rapid urbanization in the U.S. and Europe? The socialist utopian Ebenezer Howard's ideas for garden cities have proved enduringly influential. His concept was to combine the advantages of both town on the one hand, so we've got town and country, to form a new magnet that he called town country. And um, the idea was that this would combine the advantages of both while mitigating the ills. <clears throat> And uh, these would be cooperatively owned satellite garden cities with, and I'm quoting from this, this list of words here, uh, bright homes and gardens, no smoke, no slums. Uh, and he promised freedom and cooperation, along with low rents and high wages. Sounds great, right? <laughs> uh, the first garden city was built north of London uh, along the railroad in 1906. Uh, there's Ebenezer in the cartoon on the right, uh, which mocks the reputation of the residents of Letchworth uh, as bizarro, sandal-wearing, half-clothed vegetarians. They were, they were freaks. Um, these ideas were imported to the U.S. and tamed into an alternative to monotonous streetcar subdivisions. Uh, Clarence Stein and Henry White Wright uh, articulated the need for new towns designed designed for the motor age. Uh, that is to put cars in their place by separating pedestrian and bicycle paths um, from the motor cars. And so here you have these footpaths here on the front, and then the rear would be attached to the, the motor court. Um, and thus was born, this is an example of Bradburn, um, was born at the American cul-de-sac. Um, though at Bradburn, the houses, as you say, as I said, faced the footways, um, and later developers adopted these cost-saving street layouts while eliminating the footways and shared parks. Uh, another American visionary was Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, his notions for what he called Broad Acre City were refined over decades, though never implemented. Uh, the notion was to re ruralize the populace into minimum four acre agricultural plots. And historically, this was happening at the same time that the country was um, past that 50% urbanization mark. So he wanted to re ruralize in the face of that urbanization. Um, and the extremely low density development pattern uh, would be navigated by cars traveling along newfangled freeways and by personal helicopters, of course, which we're still waiting for. <laughs> And today, we have the apotheosis of these various visions for urban decentralization. 
uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York attempted to tackle this problem uh, and the politics driving it in the uh, foreclosed um, rehousing the American Dream show a few years ago, uh, for which five design teams led by architects uh, were asked to reconceive publicly owned suburban sites across the country. Uh, and two shown here resonate with these historical paradigms, and these are hypothetical projects, obviously, for a museum. Um, the, on the top is Garden in the Machine uh, for the Latino uh, immigrant suburb of Cicero, Illinois, outside Chicago, uh, led by um, Studio Gang Architects. Um, and on the bottom is Nature City uh, for Keyser, Oregon, uh, by the New York firm Work AC. And note this huge, the central feature is a huge uh, compost mound for generating biogas energy. But it's important to remember that suburbs are not, and never were, as homogenous as we tend to imagine them. Uh, some of the stereotypes have their roots in marketing and lobbying campaigns of groups like NARA, uh, the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, who were explicitly in the business of selling the dream. Uh, here are images of self-built, working class, and African American housing on the outskirts of Detroit. Uh, the black neighborhood on the right, and I don't know if some of you know this story, um, was segregated from an adjacent white neighborhood by this concrete wall, uh, which the FHA required the developer to build before they would ensure uh, the newer white development on the other side of the, the wall, uh, in the interests of maintaining homogeneity within neighborhoods. So the roots of structural racism in suburbia uh, extend back to racially restrictive private deeds as at the Country Club District in Kansas City. And then there are the infamous federally sanctioned HOLC maps that led to discriminatory redlining. Um, here's the example from Philadelphia, where everything in the center city is red. Um, and the legacy of this history is seen today in predatory lending practices and, and racial steering. Uh, now we come to the most stereotypical suburban paradigm, uh, which characterizes the uh, post-war period of mass suburbanization. In the housing boom from 1944 to 1965, 26 million new non-farm homes were built, mostly in suburbs, and much of it by a small coterie of large home builders. Uh, Park Forest outside Chicago was an iconic example. Here, amid the coffee clutch, uh, we may note the prominent presence of a television, uh, the suburban window on the world. Another iconic post-war plant subdivision was Lakewood, outside Los Angeles, uh, where large-scale production builders took advantage of federal loan programs uh, to efficiently transform large tracts of agricultural land seemingly overnight. The cultural backlash was immediate. Malvina Reynolds and Pete Sieber mocked the ticky tacky boxes of Levittown, Valley City, uh, and countless other places. Uh, photographer Bill Owens um, in 1970 had more empathic from the ground up point of view. Uh, in this example, quite literally, uh, he's quoted in the caption as saying, in one day, you have a front lawn. It's a miracle. <clears throat> the spawn of this period included the rise of environmentalism, as suburbanites were hit with pollution from their own backyards, uh, in this case, detergents from faulty septic tanks, and cesspools uh, turning up in tap water, which was called white beer. Uh, in the late 20th century, we saw an explosion of non-residential developments in suburbs as office jobs and retail decanted out of central cities. Uh, vast, unplanned agglomerations of office parks and shopping malls, dubbed Edge Cities, uh, by the journalist Joel Moreau. Um, how many of you have read that book? Familiar with Edge Cities? Yeah. Um, they sprung up like mushrooms at highway interchanges. Supersized regional shopping malls were built as all-in-one destinations. Though the Mall of America was arguably the last of its breed, at least in North America. Uh, note the happy just married couple enjoying a ride at Camp Sweetie. So, where are we now? Is the nation sprawled out? 
or with a financial crisis and, and recession, just a pause in an exorable process and it's time to get back to, to business as usual. Uh, we can look to current research into the real estate market of the present and near future uh, that suggests increased and increasing demand for walkable urbanism and data indicating the potential for a staggering future flood of detached houses and zombie subdivisions. And I point you to, to the writings and research of, of Chris Leinberger and uh, Arthur Chris Nelson for more. So how can we best leverage the lessons of this history of suburbanization and its discontents to help shape a better future? These uh, six historical paradigms of suburbanization figure heavily in the cultural imagination of North America and throughout the globe and continue to exert powerful forces. Uh, so in this next short part of my talk, um, I'll consider the critical discursive response within the design disciplines and academy to the built phenomenon of mass, post-war mass suburbanization. Uh, so, at the same time that influential urban writers like Jane Jacobs and Louis Mumford were collectively declaring that hell had moved to the suburbs, um, some architects were beginning to question this blanket condemnation. Here you see the 1976 Signs of Life exhibit that the Cherry Spot Brown architects um, by, that it grew out of their, their Yale research studio called Learning from Levittown, or Remedial Housing for Architects, uh, for which they examined the symbolism of post-war split-level ranch as, as an example of what they called a vernacular. The construction of Seaside began in the early 1980s, uh, designed by young architects uh, Anders Guani and Elizabeth Clayton Sopper. Uh, Seaside was a startlingly new slash old resort town. It was inspired by the existing local vernacular of tin-roofed beach colleges, the 1920s master plans of John Nolan, and the provocations of Leon Creer. Uh, while Seaside was, to some critics, merely a resort town, it was an effective and stark rebuke to conventional subdivision practices. Meanwhile, on the West Coast, a group of academic architects began to advocate for good urbanism as an essential component of ecologically sensitive, energy efficient design. The efforts of CNU founder Peter Calper, Doug Helbaugh, and others crystallized in the pedestrian pocket diagram on the right there, a revival of the streetcar suburb paradigm I, I introduced earlier um, with the Garden City vision. Um, this is, of course, the origin of TOD, or transit-oriented development. By the early uh, 1990s, with the rise of age cities, attention shifted to the commercial realm. A full-throated critique arose, targeting the inauthenticity of these agglomerations and the attendant erosion of a democratic public sphere. The question was, how might design engender democratic, environmentally responsible space? And I just want to note these great before and after renderings um, of uh, promoting the retrofit of Kendall in Edge City, um, southwest of Miami. Uh, just note the guy's tie, right? It's hot and dusty, and then once they, the arcades come in, it's but, uh, so. Uh, a decade later, it had become clear that the suburban shopping mall type that had transfixed the discourse of public space was actually entering the twilight of decline. Uh, and here's where my first book, Retrofitting Suburbia, comes in, written with Ellen. Um, these are examples from our case study of Mashpee Commons on Cape Cod, arguably the earliest examples of, example of a suburban retrofit of a, of a strip mall. Still ongoing. Uh, in which a conventional strip center was re-inhabited and the parking lots around it redeveloped to create what uh, Charles Bowl has characterized as, quote, an attachable fragment of urbanism. In effect, a downtown for a community that didn't historically have one. And here's a diagram of the, the civic buildings and the armature of civic places that were embedded in that, that scheme. Um, 
the, the fulfillment of a classic uh, new urbanist strategy. So you have a public library, post office, and so on uh, in the project. Um, so then in the first decade of this century, as Dan Walls was uh, the need to redress these failed properties became more widely apparent. It was no longer simply an aesthetic question. It was economic, environmental, and social. Suburban areas could no longer credibly be derided and dismissed as populated only by middle class and upper middle class whites. This chart shows, I'm sorry it's a bit, it's a bit uh, bled out, but it shows the characteristics of immigrant suburbs um, on average and for different U.S. metropolitan areas. So there's a growing percentage of suburbs with high numbers of foreign-born residents, um, which are socioeconomically and, and racially diverse. And you can see here, for example, Miami is dominated by low-income Hispanic immigrant suburbs. Uh, New York is kind of a mix, Los, as is Los Angeles. Uh, San Francisco is dominated by middle-income Asian immigrant suburbs. Uh, Washington, D.C. by a mix of high-income mixed and middle-income uh, African-American. So uh, and here's an image of an African immigrant family, one of a series of portraits revealing diversity in suburbs of Minneapolis and St. Paul. So now I'm going to talk about three strategies for sprawl retrofitting. Uh, the aging of the physical fabric of first sectors, especially of commercial properties, um, is leading to lots and lots of underperforming asphalt in these dramatically over-retailed uh, suburban landscapes in recent decades. Um, so what can we do with all these surface parking lots? There are various dynamics driving sprawl retrofit, uh, GH, uh, emissions and climate change, the rise of suburban poverty, public health and lots of research correlating sedentary lifestyles with uh, 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 of health crises. Um, I also want to highlight specifically longevity and the attendant rise in uh, one and two person households. So people are long outliving their child rearing years for which conventional suburbs were built. Um, diversity I've already touched on. And then there's also this issue of leapfrogging patterns. So the places that were once on the periphery are now actually more central as, as sprawl has continued uh, beyond that. So those are some of the, the most potent target areas for sprawl retrofit. Uh, Ellen and I introduced the term incremental metropolitanism uh, to advocate for a polycentric vision that could be advanced by the retrofitting of appropriate sites, uh, which would be densifying and diversifying of nodes along transit served corridors um, and de-densifying other sites, spaces in between. Uh, for ecological repair. And we identified three uh, main strategies or approaches, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, Re-inhabitation, or various forms of adaptive reuse. Uh, redevelopment, uh, or urbanization of sites by increasing density, walkability, and the mix of uses. And re green, which can range from the insertion of small parks and plazas, bits of, of public space, um, to restoring wetlands ecologies and wildlife corridors at the, at the larger regional scale that were broken off by the, the rapid development, filling in of wetlands and development of, of large commercial properties. So these can be used alone or in various uh, combinations. I'll talk about each in turn. So uh, in many cases, the best strategy really is to encourage re-inhabitation of older retail sites, uh, small community-oriented businesses, uh, like ones uh, those those one finds uh, serving immigrant communities. Many uh, ghost boxes, that's the term for a big box store, uh, have been converted to more community-serving uses. This is a, a big grocery store that was retrofitted into a branch public library. And so here you see the transformation of the impervious surface of the parking lot, the drainage swale and the landscaping, but also importantly, the addition of a public community serving use into an area dominated by private commercial uses. And we must appreciate 
appreciate the power of food to help turn the place around. Uh, so this strip center was uh, repositioned into a hip center, um, starting with a boutique grocery store and a coat of uh, bright orange print. And it's become a very active uh, third place for its neighborhood, uh, addressing that need identified by sociologist Ray Oldenburg. It's not home, it's not work, but a third place for people to hang out and socialize and interact. And here we have a gas station rehabilitation retrofit. Um, this is a station designed by uh, Mies van der Rohe for Standard Oil. And recently it was re-inhabited as Le Station, it's in Montreal, it's in French. Um, Le Station, a joint youth and senior center. Um, and I have to say that these professional photos uh, from the architect seem a bit left. So I took the liberty of using Photoshop uh, to add some signs of light. So I feel like I'm rushing here. I had a lot of material I wanted to talk about, so I hope I'm not going fast. But there'll be time for questions at, at the end. Um, so second strategy, uh, redevelopment. Uh, that is the systemic transformation of large, prototypical, single-use, car-dependent sites that have failed. Um, and in these cases, the contention is that it's changing the underlying urban structure, the morphology, not all simply the current uh, building uses and densities um, that constitute a, a significant tax for a uh, small <coughs> uh, So here's a, a smallish scale example on the right from Levittown, New York, which is in my back, backyard. Uh, and it represents diversifying the housing stock uh, by adding housing or townhouse housing uh, for, for seniors. Uh, and these images are from Galina Cacieva's A Sprawl Repair Manual. Uh, so here on the top you see additions to front yard setbacks, um, which can transform the urbanism of residential streets while potentially allowing for live work use or for a second unit on the lot, perhaps for those adult children who recent studies have shown are all flocking back to the the whole nest. Um, retrofitting the loops and lollipops of residential subdivisions, as shown in the, in the bottom image, is difficult um, because of all the individual owners uh, for each, each lot and, and structure. Uh, but there are circumstances where it, it can be and has been accomplished. Uh, this is a case of an entire subdivision of 69 dwellings. Um, that are being urbanized. Uh, it's a proposal at the Washington, D.C. Metro Rail, Rail Station of Vienna, so it's, it's adjacency to, to a major uh, transit hub that has uh, prompted this. So these 69 houses were purchased, and the site is being developed as a, as a TOD. And the overall build-out will have over 1,000 units, so that's a significant increase in, in uh, residential dwelling unit uh, density. 69 to And here's Mashby Commons again, I showed you earlier. Uh, it illustrates a somewhat incremental process of uh, redevelopment venture uh, due to the many, many regulatory barriers that, um, that the, the project faced. Um, it's now permitted for major expansion, so the addition of several compact uh, interconnected residential neighborhoods surrounding that attachable fragment at, at the center. Um, and the first phase residential neighborhoods began in uh, 2014. Um, basically, these neighborhoods were illegal, according to the, the large lot zoning uh, on Cape Cod, where they had never put in um, uh, sewers and so on. So that's been part of this, this long, this long uh, slog process of, of retrofit. Uh, much of the, the pioneering work done in early retrofits, like much of the comments, um, primarily by people affiliated with the CMU, uh, to confront the restriction of suburban zoning, uh, separation of uses, setbacks, large lot zoning, overly wide streets, um, paid off in uh, later projects such as this one. This is Belmar uh, in Colorado. It's a, a public-private partnership uh, project, and it was a 106-acre site uh, that was broken up into 22 separate urban blocks. 
and the land of the streets was deeded into public ownership. So rather than a large single private uh, uh, parcel, you have now public ownership of the, the, the new streets. So that will help uh, promote the, the long-standing resiliency of this, of this retrofit. Here's the location of Belmar relative to, to Denver. Is anybody been there? Uh, here is one of a series of morphological diagrams. This was part of the methodology that Ellen um, Dunn Jones and I used, mapping not only the retrofit but its surrounding context, um, space 40, 20 to 40 years apart. So, this is a, a 1975 figure field where the old Via Italia Mall um, was, was there. By 1995, the uh, mall was dying and it was the beginning of the, the retrofit. Um, the local government took the initiative in identifying a relative a redevelopment partner. Um, and here's the projected build out by 2020, um, which would triple the build density of the site and add many residential units where there were zero uh, before. And here you can see the urban design. So the block pattern of the adjacent subdivisions was pulled through the site to make the new, new morphology, the urban morphology. Um, there's also two public spaces, so there's a hardscape plaza here, and then a two-acre green uh, there to make it more walkable, in addition to uh, public transit, and, and so on. So here you see the before and after. So before, in happier days for the mall, say, I don't know, the day before Christmas, right? Um, and then this is the 100% corner um, in, the, in the retrofit. And you see the mix of uses. First of all, you see the density kind of step down. Um, We've got residential single loaded apartments over retail, office over retail, and then stepping down across the arterial to the, the ranch houses of the older subdivisions uh, surrounding it. Uh, it's important to note that this retrofitting isn't displacing people who want to live in uh, traditional suburban neighborhoods. It's taking these underperforming sites and creating pockets of transit served walkability to offer more choices in the larger metropolitan area for, for people. Some of your design tactics here, you can see this wrapping of the box, so reusing the box. That's one of the old anchor department stores for the mall that was not demolished. And so then it's wrapped with this new liner of office over retail. And then this is the, the um, multi cinema, multiplex cinema, which is similarly wrapped. So this is a hybrid urbanism. And then this is just some images of some of the public spaces and streetscapes in Belmont. Uh, I'd like to add, uh, emphasize here that we don't advocate that every regional mall become like Belmont. Um, rather, that malls can be retrofitted to meet local needs and that each could become more differentiated. So it's not just swapping one formula for another. It's not one class fits all. Um, strategies will differ, the markets will differ, the regional dynamics will differ. But, um, and so densification and adaptive reuse are not going to work everywhere. Sometimes re-greening is a more appropriate strategy. Um, it's becoming more, more common to convert vacant properties into gardens and parks to stabilize surrounding home values, protect long-term natural resources. There's also uh, gardening in the front lawn, so it's kind of a grassroots thing about thinking uh, the public space, face of your residential property to the, the neighbors. Um, Regreening uh, provides opportunity to restore the local ecology, as in this example. This is the Phelan neighborhood in, in St. Paul. And when the shopping, the strip shopping center died, um, the city reconstructed the site's original wetland. So wetland had been filled to build the strip center. That parking lot had always had drainage and leaking problems. Um, so they, they reconstituted a wetland and then put in new housing around it, which now was waterfront facing property. So you can see the before and after uh, here. Um, this also, this project represented the first new private investment in 40 years in a, in a low income neighborhood on peripheral um, uh, St. Paul, and it also provides wildlife habitat. So this image on the right shows where the site fits in the larger um, um, bird migration uh, corridor. And here in North Seattle, it's an example. We're going to Seattle next year, right? Yeah. 
Um, here's an example that brings all three retrofitting strategies together. So this lower quadrant, this overfill parking lot, which was never used, um, at the Northgate Mall, and this has the distinction of being the first mall designed with the classic dumbbell form, with the anchor stores, department stores at each end, and, and one in the middle, it's by John Graham. Um, so, uh, this has been redeveloped in a project that represents a negotiated resolution of a long-standing conflict with environmentalists. Because this site, um, the headwaters of Thornton Creek, which drains 680 acres um, for the watershed, had been culverted in a six-foot diameter pipe under this parking lot for decades. So here, then, you had a soft infrastructure solution that was engineered to handle that stormwater run runoff and help cleanse the water before it went onto the sound. And you also then had this higher density uh, mixed use development on that same property. And then adjacent, this is going to be the terminus of a light rail uh, to downtown Seattle. So um, part of this is the senior apartments. So you can imagine, this is me imagining the daily constitutional of a resident who might walk to the mall, which has a you sort of walk in the mall, especially in bad weather, and perhaps pick up the newspaper and a cup of coffee, go to the new library and community center, which was built on a brownfield that had been the Sears Auto Store. You know how those are all around the, the mall. It was turned into a, a library and community center, and, and so on. So it's really, you see this gradual, all these projects accreting together um, to address a neighborhood that had been audio-oriented, making it more walkable and also more responsive to the needs of the residents who have aged along with the, the real estate. So here you see a few more, more details of this. Um, a well-designed, ecologically contributing open space and park uh, can be a catalyst for reviving and stabilizing the value of properties around it or even new construction like a new, uh, And now, here's a list of 11 urban design tactics derived from the examination of what has worked in the multiple case studies that Ellen Dunn Jones and I have been tracking now for uh, almost a decade. Um, so I won't go over these in detail, there's no time, uh, but they range from reusing the box, um, as in the big box re-inhabitation uh, retrofits that I showed you earlier, uh, to the imperative to invest in durable, environmentally responsive, high-quality design and materials for buildings and places that will be resilient over time. For the architect, this means designing buildings and forms that can be reused for residential, for office, for who knows what other kinds of uses. Um, it also means landscapes that are more performative and mixes that uh, will help us, of course, overcome our dependency on um, cars. It's not that you can't have a car, but you need to have a choice. That's the underlying thing, is to build uh, and design our choices into these places. Um, so an article summarizing these tactics is available on the Build a Better Bird website. Uh, it's now powered by CNU. It came out of that design competition from Long Island that I organized about years ago now, and now this is a CNU uh, site. I invite you to all visit it. Um, and to summarize, to, to kind of conclude, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, next steps. So there is a CNU Build a Better Birds Rural Retrofit Initiative. There was a council a couple of months ago in Miami um, that set up five tracks to help get it done. Uh, municipalities, citizens, developers, finance, and equity. Um, and I invite any of you who are involved with these things, are interested in learning more, want to contribute, to come to the Build a Better Burks Fall Retrofit Session on Saturday afternoon at the A-Loft. Um, and, and we can discuss it further. I, I imagine some of you have, we need more, always, new, new ideas, perspectives, case studies, uh, uh, members interested in, in working with us on this project. So, thank you. Uh, I've got 10 minutes for Q&A. I know I've been kind of stuck behind the desk there, but 
Any any questions? Yes. And you talk about the economics and to what extent if they are favorable, they uh, reduce the sort Well, I think this is where some of those strategies come in. So if you've got a hot market and you've got a dead property, then you have the opportunity for a much denser kind of retrofit to, to occur there when the surrounding kind of numbers look good. <laughs> From a, from a marketing um, perspective. There are other cases that in order to stabilize the periphery, municipalities might need to assist with the regreening of those sites. There's a de-densification of them, which can help stabilize and create better opportunities perhaps elsewhere in, in a region. So you know, my short answer is it depends. <laughs> but that's one of the things certainly other people, different from myself, are more expert in some of the economics of, of getting it done, and I can point to that too. Chris Nelson's writing about how to do public-private partnerships well. He's got a recent book about that, which I would recommend checking out. Come to the session on Saturday. Um, I think the, the, the group on, on finance and developers will have more, more kind of boots on the ground uh, 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 lessons to, to share. That certainly is being done, and this is one of the things of that larger conversation that sets up a cities versus suburbs dichotomy, that it's one or the other, or that these are the places that we have because that's what people want. There are lots of other, other factors involved in making the places that we currently have, and also can be involved in evolving them and transforming and retrofitting. Like a soft infrastructure, yeah, yeah. When you see that data in Ireland and New York, we sort of a high design version of. Well, the one in Seattle was designed by city engineers. Yeah. <laughs> Working with a landscape architect. Well, yeah. Insofar as we can agree with this, that they're not necessarily uh, something that looks good for nationally, but a lot of human touch and design. Yeah. I'm going to ask if you think that that's, what your opinion is on that versus more naturalistic form that we saw in I think, again, the answer is it depends what's going to work best in any given context. One of the things, you know, part of the narrative about the shopping mall was that it was de facto public space because there were no real public civic spaces where one could just exercise one's uh, civil rights to congregate with other people and discuss politics or other kinds of things because these were private property. And you know, the official public space was for recreation or various specific kinds of activities. Whereas that notion of the kind of the urban square where people can just mingle and congregate and have conversations and discussions were largely absent, especially in the, in the post war suburban areas. So, regreening in that sense can, can range from just putting in a little plaza or park within a larger project where there's a space where you don't have to be shopping, you don't have to be doing some specific programmed activity, but can just be in the presence of your neighbors and other, other citizens to these larger projects. And I think a lot of the larger projects is evidence that um, that we can do a lot with soft infrastructure to help manage stormwater and make better performing places and how they're integrated in high density parts of the transect, how they're integrated in the suburban density parts of the transect, and, and so on and then in the, in the rural. There may even be a place for some re-ruralization, which could involve urban or suburban agriculture, which is a different thing um, as well. And often it's actually not so great for stormwater and other kinds of things, but you have a social uh, um, advantage or benefit from introducing agricultural use um, on some land. So there's a whole spectrum of things there that are part of the potential toolkit. Any other questions? Come on up, up there. A couple of your redevelopment examples were from the extremely high-end communities. Yeah. Uh, Cape Cod and Vienna outside of DC. Where's the hope for projects like that in the other 99% of the United States? Particularly, where is it where it's most needed in the first year summers? Well, I think 
a lot of the, the rehabilitation projects, that's where I wanted to get at some of that, where you have um, kind of first year urbanizations or pre-World War II urbanization can be can be quite conducive to to maintaining or creating or rewinding um, the urbanization that, that was already there but has languished through competition of new or bigger malls elsewhere. So that's one question. I think the Mashpee example, the Cape Cod example is it's kind of mixed, right? Because Mashpee is the kind of center part of Cape Cod. That's where the Native American reservation was. It tends to be more year-rounders living there and so on. So, so it's not all the 1%. There are the vacationers that come in. Um, and this was really trying to create a year-round community that would be more affordable and, and using Massachusetts 20B laws to help get more affordable units in there that could be smaller, more compact. So you want to you want to um, sometimes retrofits can be pushing against exclusionary zoning kinds of practices and regulations that are about sort of building the barricades and protecting um, uh, what wealth might exist in some, some places. Uh, so that's a part of the, the, the narrative as well. But I think, um, so again, when I show an example like Belmore, although Belmore also has become, it's the fourth largest municipality in Colorado and it has now become uh, largely Hispanic. So it is a kind of working class, middle class city. Um, and Del Mar represents a place where people can mingle and come together, all the different groups in that city that originally um, became a city in the 1960s to avoid annexation into the city of Denver. Um, so so there's, there's sort of these long, interesting histories attached to each of the, the, the case studies. So again, I think, um, if there are good buildings that have been vacated, can we bring in community serving uses? Can we think about ways to open up local folks to find ways to, to reuse those spaces creatively and to help sort of service the, the needs of the folks who are there is, is one answer. And those are often less cinegraphic examples, right? But they're happening, they're real, they're important. I have a question about um, regional interconnectivity. I, I love all the projects that you've, that, that you've shown, and I'm sure you're thinking about um, metropolitan um, growth and, and that kind of thing. Um, I live in a medium-sized city in Tristan, Virginia, and um, there's actually a county that actually refuses to have transit. Um, and so, you know, you know, you know how, how do we actually weave together places that really aren't transit viable, but you might have a little piece that you could densify here and a little piece over here. So what do you think the long term, maybe, you know, the 50 year <coughs> or even 100 year outlook for places like this might be? Well, again, this isn't going to happen everywhere. Part of it is, is responding to opportunity. So communities that, where the commercial property is fully leased out, property values remain high, everybody's just happy with the status quo. Right? And those can often be places that enact exclusionary policies, too, or things that are coded in various ways um, to exclude others or difference. And uh, what sort of legal means can be used to challenge that, I think, is, is one question. That's not really part of what I've talked about here. Uh, there's, there's, so the, there's a few things. One is that part of the overall goal regionally for retrofitting is that each great, great field we can retrofit potentially one fewer greenfield that we urbanize out of the periphery. So those things are, are connected. So ways that we can use regional planning or other kinds of mechanism to not only incentivize retrofitting, but de-incentivize or de-incentivize <laughs> uh, uh, greenfield development in areas that are even more difficult to serve with transit than some of these inner areas that with some retrofitting and wrangling and reorganization of the density and the mix of uses are potentially transit servable, if not transit exclusive, or at least transit servable. And I think there's other kinds of ways to think about transit, too. I'm increasingly interested in um, little local uh, uh, shuttle services and other things that, that are coming out not from sort of official regional transit authorities, but are kind of piggybacking on the routes and stops and can be more flexible in terms of their headways and who they serve and that pricing and so on. So there's there's that kind of uh, approach as well, which is reminiscent of how the original streetcars were all part of the bill. 
um, back in the day. Uh, so I think I, there was another point I was going to make, and I have forgotten it. But part of it is you've just got to, you know, you can't solve everything all at once, right? So it's triage a little bit, and, and direct your efforts to the, the places that are are willing, ready, and receptive. And it may be some of the other places, if their mall dies, these things can happen. When a mall dies, it can be a precipitous event because it's not resilient like a place with multiple blocks and lots of different buildings where if one building is vacated, you can be creative about refilling that. When a mall starts to die, it's like it's like the right? Thank you. Other, other? Other questions? I guess our time is up, so uh, yeah, I'll still be around here if anybody wants to chat, and I hope to see some of you on Saturday or um, at other venues throughout the next few days. Come up and say hello.